coming up this week on the Course of Life podcast at the Valspar. We had a debut winner, which surprised a few people out there. And of course, it's Dell Match Play Week for the last time here in Austin, Texas. I just spent the day at the course and I have some really cool tidbits from the world's best golfers coming your way. Plus, we're tuned into Lucky Hank and Star Trek. And this week's guest, History Week. That's right. We're getting with a couple of historians, one who we've had on the show before and a new guest as well talking about Dr. Bern Bernanke and Bill Robertson, both from the Golf Heritage Society on all things historical in the game of golf. Love catching up with them. Plus, we get into Scotty Shevler's masterful menu, and I have some breaking news on the podcast because I talked to Scotty himself about the menu. We clarify something very important when we always end with food. All of it brought to you by our pals at Desert Fox Golf. Look forward to rocking the Desert Fox hat all week at the match play. And you'll see me out there, Mike. You'll see me on TV. You'll see me from the boat on Friday. And I'll be rocking my Desert Fox golf merch. But beyond that, they make the phone caddies, the cigar holder, the swing aid tumbler, and a whole lot more to make your golf, your golf cart, your golf attitude life just a little bit better when you're out there on the course. So again, check out Desert Fox Golf and everything they have to offer with promo code Course of Life. You save 10%. Promo code Course of Life to save 10% at Desert Fox Golf. Hello, interwebs, and welcome to Course of Life. We are proud to be presented by our friends at Desert Fox Golf and Forest Golf. I'm Michael. He's Alex. And Alex, they were still in Florida for one more week at the Innisbrook Copperhead Course for yes. the Valspar with some of the best tee markers in the in 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 the season, which oh, is paint cans. cans. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the trophy that looks like a snake, but is actually a paintbrush with paint coming out of it. It's actually oh, really, yeah. welcome really to the snake pit, as they say. I, I love yes. it there. Uh, and uh, we thought maybe Jordan Spieth was going to get it all together and have it all work out for him, and he didn't. Instead, it went to uh, Taylor Moore. I, I don't know who that is because, you know, we haven't talked about him ever, but he is now number nine in the FedEx Cup standings. Very quietly. Yeah, no, he's racked up a couple of sneaky good finishes, but obviously this was his debut win on the PJ Tour, and he did it in kind of an interesting fashion, just that old-fashioned thing we talk about once in a while. Sometimes you, there's a tough course, and it's not great conditions on Sunday, and there's a guy that's maybe like two, three groups ahead, and if he just posts a good enough number, it usually just holds up and the rest of the guys bogey and fold. And that's exactly what happened in Taylor Moore's case. I had Spieth all week, like you mentioned, and it was the full Jordan Spieth experience, both in golf and in betting on Jordan Spieth, Mike. I mean, the whirlwinds of emotion with this guy on the golf course. There was a day when he had seven pars, five bogeys, five birdies, and he is all over the place hitting water balls on Sunday and through the woods and over the house and up through grandma's neighborhood to get to the hole. Just just quite an experience all week watching Jordan Spieth play golf. It's amazing that he can bat it around and still finish a shot or two off the lead when it's all said or done. Yeah, and, and he kind of highlighted how difficult this course is. So the question becomes, and I, I have my answer, did Taylor Moore win the tournament or when there was a three-way tie mm. with him, Adam Shishenk, and Jordan, sure. uh, did they, Adam and Jordan, just lose it and did Taylor just happened to be the last man standing. I think Taylor won it because he didn't bogey his last couple holes there like everyone else did. Fair enough. Yeah, if you want to compare scorecards, then the answer is he won it. If you just want to look at the way the events unfolded, it felt like you know this was either Shanks or Spieth's tournament to win. They they were neck and neck most of the day. More crept up late on the leaderboard and posted the number when he needed to. Uh, so mix of both, obviously. But the bottom line is, and we've and we've showcased this every once in a while on the PJ Tour. You have a win like this where guy just kind of pops up. Gets in a little early, posts a good number, and it's good enough, and he wins from the driving range. That, that should be like a new expression. You know what I mean? You, you win. What a, what a feeling to win from the driving range. You don't even have to hit a play, play a playoff hole or anything like that. Uh, yeah. So a unique experience for Taylor Moore. Can we also shout out Tommy Fleetwood, who uh, we keep forgetting, I feel like, has never won on the PGA Tour. He had yeah. another t- t- T3 finish here. He just... <laughs> Man, I feel bad for him. I really and do. I, and we love Tommy, too. That's the yeah. thing. He, he's Jesus. such a lovable he's, guy. Jesus. 
<laughs> he is. Everything about him is amicable, uh, amable, and uh, yet he's not lifted a trophy on the PGA Tour. It seems weird to say because he's a mainstay on tour. He plays in all the biggest events. He's contended at majors. He's won several times in Europe. But you're right. Funny, weird fact in golf is still that Tommy Fleetwood has not technically won on the PGA Tour. Pretty wild. Yeah, it's just crazy. Uh, let's talk about some other things from the week because there was some interesting things going on. Uh, mm, yes. Let's start with uh, a new camera view. Yes, that's right. A uh, bag cam, Mike. I don't, know, I don't know if you saw this at all. It was very short-lived. But are, are you interested in the view from the player's bag? Kind of like as if you're the caddy, you know, standing next to Justin Thomas as he hits his wedge from 150 yards out. Or, or would you be into that view? They used it in limited capacity this past week. I, I don't really care about that view. I care more about hearing the audio between the caddy and the player during those mm. times. That's what yes. I want to hear. I want I want these guys mic'd up all the time. There was some awesome audio, not only from obviously Spieth and Michael Greller this past week when they're in contention, they're gold, but when Shank hit his tee shot on the 72nd hole, Mike, right up against the tree, he, he could only hit the, the ball lefty for his second shot. Yeah. And he basically just straight up told his caddy, like, listen, I know this isn't the smartest play right now, but I'm on the 18th hole of the PJ Tour, and I got to make a par for the playoff. Like, I'm hitting this thing lefty. And the, the caddy was like, all right, man, yeah, go for it. <laughs> but sure enough, he did make a nice recovery. But yeah, it's it's great hearing that audio. So bag cam or not, as long as we can just get the mics close, that's that's what we really want up here. Maybe we just need a bag microphone. Yeah, fair just, enough. That, yeah, that's, that's really the compromise, I think. The yeah, bag mic. Maybe. There you go. Uh, talk to me about Justin Thomas, by the way. <laughs> yes, this was great. A little Twitter moment that I don't know if a lot of people saw, so I need to direct their attention to it. You, you may have seen early in the week, there was the other JT uh, beef going on between JT Justin Thomas and JT Poston and his caddy, who jokingly wore uh, the other JT uh, caddy bib. That obviously got the attention of the internet. But unfortunately, Mike, both of these JTs are forgetting that there is another JT who happens to play golf that absolutely dominates both of them and takes that nickname away immediately. C can you guess who that is? Worldwide um, superstar, musician, boy band, Hall of Famer. Oh, from our, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Justin Timberlake. Yeah. yeah, so he came right over the top on Twitter and, and basically got in the replies of this beef between Justin Thomas and JT Boston and, and basically said, uh, by the way, the real JT has entered the comments. And it was a quite a mic drop moment by Timberlake, uh, just reminding us that golfers are, are just golfers, Mike. They're, they're not true. really stars. You know? I mean, I mean, I, you know, if they're not stars, then why do we have a podcast that we've been hosting <laughs> the last you know, four or five years now? Uh, great moment between the JTs there, just reminding us that the J JT is really Justin Timberlake yeah, until further true. notice. He's the OG. He is. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about that other golf tournament uh, tour out there, Live. They actually had a tournament this weekend. I, I didn't even realize it until like Sunday night. Uh, they were in Tucson. They were, their, yes. Their Tucson, whatever they want to That's call it. That's an old PGA know. Tour stop they used to have yeah. there a long time ago. Yeah. And I just want to call out uh, Bryson DeChambeau at seven over par, 44th place. Graham McDowell, two over par, 41st place. Uh, you know, just great play here. Ian Poulter, 35th at even par for the week. Uh, just great play out of these guys. Phil Mickelson, 32nd. Phil Mickelson, uh, one under par for the week, but 32. But it ended up having a four-man playoff between Louis Oosthuizen, Brendan Steele, Carlos Ortiz, and Danny yeah. Lee. I mean, there was playoffs, a I guess they do playoffs. I thought they'd have some sort of weird like shootout where they do like we had Tiger and Phil on the 18th green into they the They should darkness. do that actually. It's funny yeah, you mention that. Like yeah. you say that jokingly, but Live Tour actually should do that. They should yeah. mix up the playoff format and just do like a closest to the pin for five mil for the win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just I one mean, swing. <laughs> so maybe they'll adapt that soon enough. But yeah, Danny Lee, Danny Lee won the playoff. And um, the bottom line is that the, uh, the Live Tour event was very, very sparsely attended. I, I watched a little bit of it. Um, great drama on Sunday. There was no denying that. It was a fantastic finish, and it was good to see Danny Lee get his first professional win in eight years. Uh, but very sparsely attended. Um, interesting article came out from Alan Shipnuck on the budgetizing. As much as those Saudis have, and that fund is unlimited, Mike, 
Apparently, there's been some budget cutbacks. And, and the first place that Alan Shipnook no- noticed the live budget cutbacks was in the media meal. They used to have nice hot entrees, and now it's just sandwiches and chips for the media covering event there. So that's when you know t- times are tough, I guess. I mean, look, the money's going to the players, not to anybody else who's there. Yes. So. <laughs> that's for and sure. Obviously, yeah. is it really going to making sure you're on TV the whole time? Because I did see a, a tweet. I don't know if it's real. I'm going to preface mm. with that. Okay. Of, of the live coverage. Uh, on the CW, all of a sudden cutting out and going to reruns of Family Guy. So, oh wow, that's t- that's a tough look. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Well, yeah, we did nice. we discussed that this isn't necessarily like the CW coming to Live Golf and saying we desperately want you. This was Live Golf going to the CW and saying, "Here's some money to to buy rights to be on here on your airwaves." Yeah. So. yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, but hey, Live Golf is uh, back in action next weekend because they play less golf. So, they take a week off and they're uh, in Orlando. So, yeah, OCN, the course right next to where the PGA show is actually, Orange County mm. National. So, we'll see what there that looks go. like. Of course. Yeah. Have fun with that, guys. Uh, but this week, you know, in the spirit of March, it's March Madness on the PGA Tour. It's the Dell match play. It's the it final time mm. in Austin. Wow. <sighs> How does it feel, Alex, to know that like, this is this is it? I actually really was a little bit seriously dreading recording this to give this mm. eulogy. This one hurt. I'm not going to lie. I gave you this news in the last month or two. And essentially what happened was there was an agreement in place uh, that did not get signed by both parties, that being the PGA Tour and the members from Austin Country Club. They went back and forth on exactly who gets what to host the tournament for this upcoming year, the upcoming years. And the negotiations got left on the table. So the tournament is not coming back. The, the Dell match play is essentially dead on the PGA Tour for the immediate future. So this could be the last time we see a PGA Tour match play event, sadly, for a bit. I, I hope that's not the case. And I hope we resurrect that come next season. But uh, yeah, this is the end of an era. And not, not only for the tournament, but for myself. It's been a seven-year run here in Austin. Uh, I was here the moment the tournament got here, and I'll be here the moment it leaves. Uh, but definitely, definitely sad to see it go. So before we talk about the field and how it works now, let's talk about how you're going to celebrate the final week of the Dell match play, because I know you have a bunch planned in between everything else you're doing this week there. So yeah, uh, what, what what's what's on tap for you? What's going on? Um, I'm going to be at the course most of the weekend for sure. I don't know about the weekdays yet, but I do know that Wednesday I'm going to be at Golfinity. Our friends at Golfinity are hosting an awesome watch party. So if you're in Central Texas, be sure to check them out. And Dylan Fratelli is going to be there. Now, unfortunately, Dylan didn't qualify for the match play. I know he would have loved to be in the field himself, <laughs> but hey. Dylan's a PGA Tour winner in his own right, so he carries some panache, and he's a former Longhorn that lives in Austin. So I'll be looking forward to seeing him there at Golfinity. Uh, maybe I'll give him a challenge, you know, close to the pin, me versus Dylan Fratelli. We'll see how that yeah. goes. You never know. And of course, uh, Austin Country Club right there on the water. Does that mean a boat is in your future as well? Yeah. I And you hear me bitch and moan about this every single year. I say that I'm going to do the boat party and go out on the water and watch the tournament from the water, and I never do. And now that I realize that this is the final iteration of playing the event, I had to do it. So I got all my friends together. The family's coming out. The da- dad's coming out on the boat with me, too. It's going to be a true party out there on the water Friday afternoon. So I'll be watching the, the final uh, day of the first three days uh, of the first round matchups. We've got four 16, bra- um, 16 four man brackets. We start with that 64 man field. And Friday's a big day, Mike, because that's when we cut from 64 to 16 and figure, figure out who wins the mini brackets and who's playing the weekend. Yeah, let's uh, let's look at the field. Let's see what we think of some of these groupings because uh, it's it's a loaded field. It's a designated event, right? Uh, oh, yeah. So we got three point six to there. the winner, twenty million dollar purse. Yeah. Scotty Scheffler, John Rahm, Rory McIlroy, Patrick Cantley, Max Holma, Xander Shoffley, Wills El Torres, Victor Hovland, Colin Morikawa, Tony Finau, Matt Fitzpatrick, Jordan yeah. Spieth, Sam Burns, Terrell doing? Hatton, Cam Young, and Sunjay M make up your top seeds. Those are the top 16 seeds here. So each one leads a group of four. Yep. Uh, which one is got your eyes on it where we could see some uh, something big happen? Well, the one I got, I drew myself immediately to because I was curious about him is our buddy Taylor Montgomery, who's been on the podcast a couple of times. I got to see yep. him out there this afternoon, get ready um, with his Monday practice round. He's playing with Kirk Kitayama and Min Woo Lee and Colin Morkow. And I was wondering what bracket he would fall on, Mike. I was curious to see where he'd fall for his debut at Austin Country Club. 
lo and behold, he's got he's got the elephant in the room. He's playing against the home team. He's in the same bracket as Jordan Spieth, which is like, mm. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I, it's like it's like walking into Yankee Stadium with a Red Sox hat on and no friends. I mean, it's it's it's, it's going to be tough for him to get through the bracket. But I told him best of luck. So we'll be out there supporting him this week. That's going to be a fun one to watch. Um, let's see who else am I looking at? How about Rory, Keegan, Bradley, Scott Stallings, Denny yeah. McCarthy? There's a group of hot putters that like this course a lot. Um, there's there's a few good brackets out there. Maybe maybe a good spot for one of those two guys to advance into the weekend. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like that that Roy McIlroy group actually could be ripe for some some upsets in there. Uh, just when you kind of look down the line of them, of course, Max Homa has to share the group with Hideki Matsuyama and Kevin Kisner and Justin Su. So, I, you know, Matsuyama, if he's looking to get hot ahead of the Masters again, he could he could certainly light something up there. Yeah, tw- um, a Kisner 2019 champion and 2018 runner up. So he's a good pick this yeah. week as well. But this tournament's very unpredictable, like you've seen. Like, throw all yeah. the seeding out, like, oh, wow, there's a number three seed and there's a number 50. It doesn't matter. The- these guys yeah, are all so evenly matched, especially in match play format, that you can really go in any direction here. Uh, my full picks and preview are going to be out. Uh, on runyourpool.com by the time you hear this. I'll tell you what my name at the top, though, who I am looking at is a guy who has never won this event, Mike, but boy, has he sniffed the trophy here hard. Um, mm-hmm. Second place the first year this event was contended. Final four, mm, two of the last three playings. Top of his game, quiet the last few weeks. But John Rahm is absolutely due to just crush and dominate this tournament. He's been knocking on the doorstep and loves, loves, loves this course. That's a tease of who I like. You can check out the rest of my picks, but definitely putting Rahm on my card this week. That's right. And we'll have uh, brackets out as well uh, once those brackets get finished. So, So the play starts Wednesday the 22nd. So that means that as you're listening to this podcast, when it comes out on Tuesday night, Picks will be out. Yeah, and the the nice caveat to this though that I do like is I love re looking. If you're looking on your sportsbook app or you're looking to make a pick for the weekend, just do the re look Friday evening. Once we just get down to sixteen, then you've got a real good idea as to who's flowing, who looked good in group play, and you can kind of re bet then and see who you like come weekend time. Once we get to the Sweet Sixteen, but. It's going to be a fun week. Saw all the world's best out there. Uh, saw more cow had some great shots. Be sure to check out COL Podcast and Course of Life Alex on Instagram uh, for my recap videos from the days out there. And uh, yes, we've we've got got a tidbit surrounding Scotty Scheffler, which you're gonna you're gonna have to hang around a little bit for as well. That's right. Let's also talk about the opposite field event because it is a WGC event with the Dell match play. And so that means there's something else going on. It is the Corrales Putacanya Championship. There you go. Uh, you know, it's just fun to see Joel Damon in the field, number 100 in the world ranking. He's nice. just, you know, everybody loves him. Love me some uh, Joel Damon. I mean, I, it's just an open field. This is a chance for someone to play well and do something different and, and win an event on tour and kind of make a difference in their career. Oh, absolutely, uh, man. We talk about these opposite yeah. field events a lot and they're legit PGA tour events and they come with all the, the, the great things of winning the PGA tour as well. Like, you know, maybe get yourself into a major championship that's coming up. Who knows? That might be yep. nice if you're out there in mm-hmm. the field at Corrales. So uh, Dylan Wu slated to tee up as well to past guests of the show. Um, so check that out on, on golf channel. Double coverage of the tour this week with the WGC and the Corrales in paradise as well. Let's switch over to Tuned In, where we share what we're tuning into outside of the world of sports. Uh, yeah, I don't think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when it when it dropped, but uh, the final season of Star Trek Picard is out. Um, and I, I am a Star Trek nerd. I do watch a lot of Star Trek. Um, and uh, I finally watched episode four. I'm still like a week behind. Okay. Thank What's the initial God. review? The show finally got good. The first season was like, yeah, it's all right. The second season was like, eh, it's okay. The first three episodes here were like, oh God, I have to, I'm going to have to you know, really grind my way through this whole season to watch it. Episode four finally got me back on the wagon here. The show show got good on, on episode four. Shout out to you and your patience for making it to uh, season three, I mean, episode I, four. I, there. I, grew, I grew up on Next Generation. So to have now in season three, too, we're getting the band back together. Everyone's there. Worf is there. Uh, Riker is there. In everyone, Dr. Crusher. I, oh, I mean, nice. the whole band's back together here. So <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Nice. Good. Shout out to you for your patience and watching the show. And it's it's paid off now, finally, for you. 
it has finally. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to need that same patience because I just watched the premiere uh, this past weekend of a new series starring Bob Odenkork. You know him as Better Call Saul, Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame. Uh, his new series, Lucky Hank. And I know you heard a little bit about this in advance uh, where Bob Odenkirk plays kind of a bewildered, aging college professor and mm-hmm. – you know, it's a, it's a pretty vanilla plot point through episode one. I'm going to have to give it some more time because just like I think with Breaking Bad and, and Saul, there's a little bit of character development. And you need to you need to see the true form of the plot and, and give it a little bit more time. So overall, I was left a little unimpressed with episode one, but I'm going to give it more time. I'm going to be a little bit more patient just like you were. So I think you taught me a little bit, a bit of a lesson for Lucky Hank. I would encourage people to give it a try if you like Better Call Saul. Look, we all can't have the first episode of a show be like The Last of Us or any other show that hooks you immediately. Not everything, you know, yeah. It's annoying that we're in that social media generation where you just hear about those shows that just like have that immediate pop, you know, not like a Last of Us or like a Euphoria or something like that. You know, the show that just absolutely jaw drop shocks you. That's the stuff that plays, sadly, right now, like in our social media era. So um, by by uh, gone are the days of some shows like this, but I appreciate what Bob Odenkirk's trying to do with the series. So I'll give Lucky Hank a little bit more of a chance, opening episode five and a half out of ten. All right, there you go. Let's uh, get into this week's guests, plural, guests. That's right. It's History Week, Mike. You ready for some history? I mean, it means we have to have the uh, Course of Life resident historian back on the podcast. Of course, Dr. Bern Bernacki from the Golf Historical Society. That's right. And Golf Heritage Society led by Bern Bernacki and his team there. And it's been great to have him on a couple times. And it's always great to connect with Dr. Bern in person. Um, I'm also going to post a video on my Twitter as well, Course of Life One. You're going to hear him talk through some really cool vintage clubs that he brought to our interview and I got a video to go along with it. So check out Twitter at Course of Life One, and you can see that as well. Um, and uh, a great chat coming with a friend of the show and Dr. Byrne here. That's right. And before we get into that chat with Dr. Byrne, let's talk about our friends at Voris Golf. You know, golf is really entrenched in its heritage and history, as Dr. Byrne reminds us every time he's come on here. Very true. But it's also a place where innovation is celebrated and where new technology is used to enhance the golf experience and that's exactly what our friends at Voris Golf do every day with what they make in their golf glove. Of course, it's super soft, comfortable, grippy leather that goes on your golfing hand, either that right or left hand. But it's got that through touch technology, Alex, that lets you still use your smart device, which you're probably using as your GPS or your scorecard or True. whatever you need it for. Yep. And now you can use it with that golf glove still in your hand. You don't need to take that glove off in between or worry about it because, you know, uh, gloves on my left hand, right hand's on the wheel, the cart, or it's on holding bag or something. That left hand sometimes needs to be able to operate the device. And now it can with that Voris Golf Glove. So VorisGolf.com is where you can head to. They got their gloves. They got sweet polos and hats as well. And you can save 18% with our promo code COL18 at VorisGolf.com. Get yourself some sweet swag that is enhancing the golf experience and save 18%. COL18 at VorisGolf.com. All right, we're back live on the PGA show floor with a friend of the show. It was great to see him here last year. We're reconnecting again. It's my buddy, Dr. Vern Bernacki, president of the Golf Heritage Society. Dr. Byrne, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, it's, Alexander. Thank you for having me here, my friend. It's great to see you again here. We're back on the show floor. It's a little bit more filled than it was last year. Uh, what's the early vibe? I know you've already been in Florida for a few days, but how are you feeling walking around here today? You know, they say that golf is booming. In post-COVID, everybody's back. Everyone wants to be together. And this place is jumping. You have to be here to to believe it, as they say. And you know what? The traffic was the immediate indicator because we got here extra early. And I still walked in here at the exact same time as I did last year. So that's how you know the crowds are out for sure. It's good to see everyone back at the PGA show. So let's catch everyone up uh, on the past year with the Golf Heritage Society. Um, Remind people about the Golf Heritage Society's mission and and just any updates uh, with the organization in the past year. here. Sure. We're we're really... um here to have fun enjoying the game of golf. And we do that a lot of ways. Um, 
Uh, we like to uh, enjoy gathering, fellowship. Uh, we have collectibles. We love to show and tell uh, with each other and new people that we meet. Um, and we really uh, enjoy the history of the game. Uh, the artifacts, each one has its story. And when we share um, the story of the artifact, we're both elevating our understanding for our friend. Uh, and we're also, you know, enjoying the, the game of golf in yet another way. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know there's the um, Hickory Club aspect and we're going to get in some vintage clubs a little bit later. But uh, you said you got to swing the Hickories. First time you'd swung in a few months. How was it out there playing with the old sticks? It was wonderful. I did two events. Uh, one was at uh, uh, Winter Park, the nine hole course. Yes, it the must, WP9 is they call it. WP9. You must try it. Um, the greens are phenomenal. They protect the green. It, it, everybody thinks it's short because it's a nine hole course. They have back to back par fives are very long. I really enjoyed it. We played it with Hickory. And then day two, we played the four club challenge, Alex. Four clubs. Oh, so which clubs did you pick? That's well, the question. I, I have a uh, three wood that I can hit off the tee, yep. uh, a spoon, we call it, uh, or off the fairway. It's sort of my long club. Um, and I took a dead stop, deep groove ridge club. And that was cool because I could use it from 100 yards in, high, low, out of the sand, and try to do the dead stop. Of course, I took a putter and I took a long iron that was reinforced so I could hit it for low, long distance. And nice. Right. Good array. I like the club selection. Um, um, people are curious out there what the yardage calibration is versus Dr. Byrne hitting a regular brand new seven iron off the rack versus a hickory seven iron. Well, well, what's about the difference? You well, know? you know, Alex, it's, it's more about the ball and the yeah. striker than it is the club. So a strong player can hit that uh, ball pretty much the same if he hits it sweet. Um, our club, Edgewood Country Club in Pittsburgh, little plug there. Uh, it's Donald Ross, and we were 100 years old last July. I asked the golf professional, uh, Pete Micklewright, if he wanted to play. He said, let's do this. So he, first time, first time Hickory's in his hand, went out and shot a 77. And I know he would have done a few put a few better if he had had a little more time to practice with that putter. Yeah. So it was great. So that's, that's you know, for, for me, I'm probably about 80, 75% okay. because the sweet spot, I'll miss it. Um, but uh, good players, it's uh, it's pretty true. We've talked about that before. That sweet spot on the Hickory Club, I don't know what it is about that. That is a completely unique feeling in the game of golf versus making contact with any other club. That still rings true to this day. It, it does feel different, and uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's sweet. It's mystery. I get yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, let's talk about an aspect of golf history that I've noticed is very popular recently, and let's break those out right there because I'm glad that you brought some vintage golf balls as well baby, too. if, if I've you could only be here with alex and i seeing yeah, what i have i i knew I, I in the past year i noticed i've seen a lot of historical golf balls gaining popularity um talk people through the golf heritage society the website and what they can see in collectibles like this um, yeah, when they, so when they browse. if you want to learn more about us it's golfheritage.org and i have a plastic container with my business cards and some gutty yeah. in it and a surprise for alex a feathery right in the middle oh uh, yes now, we've talked about this before yeah, this feathery is is recently made, uh, so it's a replica, but it was made the old way with a hat full of goose feathers, mm -hmm. wet, stuffed into this cowhide. Goose feathers. Together. Wow. And so when I hold the, this little feathery, it, it looks like what your seven-year-old would make out of Play-Doh, but it's got this amazingly hard surrounding layer. And it's also got a bit of a volleyball shape, too, which I wouldn't have expected back in the day, but... Lo and behold, that's what that's what the originals look like. And, and you can go to the website and check out the whole the whole variety of the yeah. Genesis. Yeah, I'm going to say too. two things about the feathery. Yeah. You know, when you line up a putt, you, you know, you look at the slope and you look at the distance, correct? And you calculate that. Well, on the feathery ball, you have to look at the shape of the ball and how you think it's going to roll when you hit it. Oh, no, it's like one of those trick <laughs> golf balls that like is lopsided and rolls from side to side. It's yep. playing so, evil games on you as if the game wasn't easy enough, uh, hard eight, enough, right? An 18 incher is a real challenge with the feathery ball. <laughs> yes. That's all I can say. No gimmies with the featheries. No gimmies here. None. Again, we're joined by Dr. Bern Runacki, Golf Heritage Society here on the PGA show floor. Um, here's a good question If you could bring back. You, you're always good with the outfits, Dr. Byrne. If you could bring back one historical piece of golf fashion, maybe something that's left back there that maybe we could bring into the 2020s. What do you think that might be? There, there's a lot of vintage stuff that's making a bit of a comeback, so I'm curious what your answer that's is. That's a great question. You know, I, I absolutely love 
uh, the design of what I see today. Uh, the one thing that might be cool is if you have something that's vested um, and have a little pocket for your tees, kind of like we, we did um, when we play with the sand tees, you have like a little handkerchief mm. in there. So you make your sand tee and then you reach in and you uh, dust off your fingers. And now you're ready to swing the club. Yeah, the pocket's necessary. I like that. Yeah, and I've seen Justin Thomas has been doing a lot. He, I think maybe he's a bit of a leader. He's at the forefront of kind of retroactively bringing the, the old gear into the new age. I've seen him do some vests. He's done the older jackets a little bit. Every once in a while, he goes for it. Creativity, I think that's the name of the game. <laughs> Love it. Um, golfheritage.org is the website. Uh, Golf Heritage Society on Instagram. Um, before we get to our quick shot questions, you brought something and we're going to walk people through a couple of these clubs because I want to get behind the stories of these. So I'm holding a few of these clubs and be sure to follow along on Instagram at COL podcast, uh, because by the time you hear this conversation, we're going to have a video uh, that's highlighting these specific clubs we're going to talk through right now. But I wanted to start with this amazing, what I appears to be a wedge. It looks like you could serve a small bowl of chili on it as well, too. Um, so explain the background to this, this wedge here. Yeah, this is a, um, a, a deep dish, if you will. Yeah, it's okay. a con cave wedge, and it's rather deep. It's not subtle. What as, period, time period said. are we going back to? Yeah, here? so um, this, this club, uh, this style uh, was played by Bobby Jones in 1930 uh, when he won the the grand slam he did some things yeah yeah and and as a matter of fact everybody kind of said you know is that unfair because of the shape of this and the design because on the flip side the amount of bounce on this is is massive yeah wow yeah so sarazen was thinking about it and walter hagen uh heard more about it and says i'm gonna both design it out and take it to market so he did so this club, it will be the heaviest club you'll ever hold. Yeah. I can almost guarantee that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it'll get you out of the sand. I can tell you that. But where it's going to land, uh, that's less predictable. Yeah, it's a, it's like a weight trainer club. You'd swing to start your round before you hit your first tee shot so the driver feels lighter. That's how, that's how heavy the thing is. I'm going to use it that way, Alex. Thanks <laughs> for the tip. Yeah, and it, again, it's so concave. I, I Before I saw this club and we hopped on, I... I was wondering if you could just hit this straight up in the air. And then you said that maybe you could also hit it twice with this club as well, too. That was the reason it was taken away as mm, a legal okay. club. Makes sense. All right, let's get to the second club here as well, too. Um, this is much more close to the hole, right when you get around the green. So I have a couple of what uh, my dad would call chippers. I've got some chippers that are about 40, 50 years old. This is going back a little bit further. Uh, explain this short game club. I, I don't want to quite call it a putter, but how would you define it? Well, you know, the, the word jigger, J-I-G-G-E-R, yep. describes something between a five, six, seven iron loft off the fringe or just outside that mm. to pitch and run and roll and knock it in the hole. Now, this club is a putter. It happens to be a um, uh, real old uh, R.T. Jones signature Calamity Jane putter. And it was made by Spalding and... Uh, the story behind the putter is that Bobby Jones was having trouble putting uh, and he was very disappointed. He saw a broken putter and he repaired it, glued it, triple whipped it, and it became his good friend and confidant. So this is a putter. It has a little degree of loft to it. I was going to say maybe, probably a few degrees, Maybe right? five to ten. Okay. Uh, maybe a little more than that. You know why? Because the high grass and the uh, the low stem, if you will, required an elevated a uh, wristy kind of putt for a long putt. And you can adjust it and take down some loft if you want to uh, and play it that way. So this club, you hopefully you'll see it on Alex's Twitter feed uh, and you'll love that too. Definitely, yeah. I'm thinking immediately about the pros today and the stingers that they hit that go about five or 10 feet off the ground. And I'm thinking they could do some pretty amazing things with this club. They really put their mind to it. This could have been one of the uh, four in the uh, four club challenge and used as a yeah, purpose. Definitely. To think of. Yeah, Very cool. All right, let's get to this last one here. Uh, I commented specifically on the club face, uh, but we're bringing out the wood right here. Okay. So this is what I would coin a, a wood, definitely a driving club. I was first took by the immaculate signature on the club. Again, COL podcast on Instagram. Course of Life one on Twitter if you want to see the photos of this as well. Uh, but walk us through this vintage driving club here. Yeah, I played this club. And as uh, you can attest, the uh, striking surface is uh, small. And um, it, this is a, a club from over there made in Scotland. 
It has a J.H. Taylor uh, signature, I believe, that came out of uh, his shop because it uh, is the Con and Taylor uh, shop. Okay. Uh, that goes way back. So uh, this particular club, um, I, I cleaned it up. I didn't restore it to a, to a point that it looked brand new American. Uh, so it's uh, understated when you see the pictures. You'll see that someone else could take it and highlight uh, the lettering a little bit more. Definitely. But yeah, it, it has a real look of, of 100 uh, to 110 year old club. Uh, the thing, Alex, that you can see, the shaft is original because of the stamp at the top below the grip. Right below the grip. Oh, wow. Okay, That's how yeah. you know if you're looking at a, an Some original real grip. There. That's, if it's there, it's for sure an original grip. We really don't replace those kind of shafts into another club, although we replace shafts all the time mm -hmm. when we break them because right. they're 100 years old. Very cool. And I was fascinated by the face of that club, too, because it's just got those laser thin grooves as well. And I love how there's just a little nick on each little spot. It's like every little shot has its own memory on this club. You know, you just create memories every day with this beauty. Yeah, you're right. It's a, it, it has a lot of uh, problems. Very cool. Again, we're joined by Dr. Bern Bernacki, friend of the show, Golf Heritage Society president. Um, why don't you run everyone through your outfit for the day? You're, you're always dressed very nicely. Well, so thank what you, you very wearing? much for that. Of course, uh, we played in uh, formal wear, necktie, yep. uh, collared shirt. Love that. Uh, and uh, I love to play my sleeves rolled up just once uh, so that I can uh, um, really enjoy the uh, the feel of the swing. <laughs> I love and, it. Um, uh, yeah, tell, keep going. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in this case, uh, I have a uh, vest sweater with the pockets as identified, and uh, I have there's a T the right there. A, he wasn't uh, lying. He's got a, the T in his pocket. A T from Bel Air uh, from playing uh, earlier in the week, uh, and that was great. What's your favorite random thing to pick up from a course like that? A T. Um, I love the ball markers. If I can afford a piece of merch, I obviously love that. What's a random little trinket you like collecting? From you know, courses? it's a great, a great question. You know, there's all kinds of collecting. But the most personal collecting is a tea, a uh, card, a uh, pencil from a famous course, uh, uh, the place where you played a first U.S. Open venue. These are relatively inexpensive. Anybody can and should collect these things and keep your personal collection about what's important to you. The others are those things you come across uh, either at a uh, bargain and a steal or that you save up because it's something that you have your eye on and you want to make part of your collection. So our collectors um, are not only golf clubs and balls, but artwork, ceramics, um, and so many things, print, print material, books. Um, uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity to enjoy the game of golf in a variety of diverse ways. Very cool. Um, let's wrap it up by reminding people where they can find out more about these clubs. I obviously directed them to our pages so they can see uh, what we talked through today, but Tell everyone where they can learn more about the history of the game through GAs as, as well. Beautiful. Yeah, that's uh, golfheritage.org. Join us today. You can join up online. We're only $50 a year. I believe we are the best bargain in nice. the game of all golf. Very cool. Um, Dr. Byrne, best of luck with everything at the show this week. Uh, life back in Pennsylvania as well, too. Uh, hit them straight. And thanks again for joining. Thank you so much, Alex, for having us. It's always a pleasure. Be Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And we're back. Great chat there with Dr. Byrne. Always love his insight and uh, those unique clubs he brought with him. Everyone's got to go check out the video. We'll have it on Instagram and Twitter so you can see what he's talking about instead of just listening. Listening is great, but seeing is better. You so have gonna, to, especially especially yeah. because of how weird these clubs are, Mike. You you wouldn't believe how guys got up and down from the bunker 150 years ago. You, you just I mean, wouldn't believe what they were using. It makes me wonder, were guys more skilled back then than they are now? They were using soup spoons, so I'm, I'm going to argue they might be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and check that out on our Instagram, COL Podcast, Twitter, Course of Life 1 as well. Let's uh, turn the page, though. Let's talk to Dr. Burns' friend and the vice president of the GHS, Yes, uh, Bill, Bill Robertson. That's right. We got down a really funny rabbit hole of old golfers. We talked about all sorts of things regarding his touch in the history of the game. But it all, of course, starts with his first memories of playing the game growing up. My first introduction to the game was in Buffalo, New York, where a business associate uh, had a concession where we supplied clubs 
to a muni in Tonawanda, New York called Brighton Golf Course. Very and cool. uh, he had this as part of his other business and I wanted to take up golf. So he gave me a Dunlap wedge and he said, if you can hit it over the building without hitting the building with the ball, I'm going to give you a set of irons. Okay. So that was it. I made it. So you mastered the wedge first, I guess. I hit the wedge over the building. That's not the worst spot to start. You know, I feel like a lot of golfers out there just want to start banging drivers and get good, but that might have been the right way to go from a younger age. (laughs) Yeah, well, soft hands was even good back then. Very cool. So you obviously been playing the game for a bit. I'm I'm curious um, what your history is with the history of the game. You know, I grew up playing, you know, in the 90s and I, it didn't really take me until maybe my high school or college years to look back at the history of the game and actually kind of what it meant in the development of clubs and technology, fashion, and everything re- regarding the game. Um, what are your favorite things to look back on regarding the history of the game and where it all well, came to you? So if I can recount from the earlier years, uh, TV, Shell's Wonderful World of Golf. Um, you, you took that right out of my notes. I literally have Shell's Wonderful World of Golf right in my, in my notes. And for everybody about. listen, this is totally unscripted, by the way. <laughs> it is. It's because they were just on a few weeks ago as I was getting ready for the show. And I just always find myself going back in time, that lovely moment in the holidays when the Golf Channel just runs through every Shell's Wonderful World of Golf possible. <laughs> it's a great look back at the history of the game. It's, it's yeah, fun to see where it, things yeah, came from. That was, a, that was a true moment for me. And then uh, certainly Arnie Palmer, I think anybody of my age, 10, y- ten years uh, before and after, had to love the game if they saw Arnie. He just was the embodiment of the sport. Do you have, uh, I have one, which is why I'm asking you first. Do you have an Arnold Palmer story? I feel like everyone maybe has some sort of well, story. They'd all, be, they, they'd all be uh, a- anecdotal and uh, you've probably heard them all. <laughs> and... Uh, I've heard a lot, lot more since uh, being involved with the GHS, since yeah. our involvement with uh, his legacy. And, uh, and Dr. Burns' connection to Pennsylvania. Well, well, and there so. you go. So yeah. uh, you guys have heard that. But yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Cool cool time to be alive to see him. I got to walk 18 holes with him as about an 11 or 12-year-old boy yeah. at a Champions Tour event holding the sign as a little kid. That's something I'll always remember. Uh, definitely a, a historical figure in the game for sure. Um, let's talk about um, some of your other favorite players growing up or golfers that you idolize in the game? Who do you, who do you like most? Uh, sure. So when I was growing up, uh, John January was an interesting guy. Yeah. He had uh, forearms the size of jackhammers. Before Bryson and everyone else did, you know? Yeah, he, he, the original buff guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was in, he was just crazy with the size of his forearms. And I remember going to a, uh, a senior event um, in my probably late 30s. He was in Syracuse and watching him hit the ball and set up. And uh, he was very, very workmanlike about what he did. He was in the moment at the time. And that's when I recognized these guys. It was their living. They weren't there at my, as I'm there a walk in the park, but they were serious and uh just wanted to to get it done, and we're all in the zone, focused. If That's you That's a great name to bring up in the history of the game. I think maybe Don January gets a little bit overlooked, but he was one of the catalysts for what is now the champions, PGA Tour champions, and he kind of set that off in the late seventies and early eighties. Yeah, there now. there was a few of them back there. Uh, he he was certainly one of them. Uh, Jim Faree, uh, he he would come out there in his in his in his regalia, always a sharp dresser. Uh, who else do I remember? Chichi back then. Oh, yeah. And, I walked 18 holes with Miller Barber back uh, in the Miller day. Miller Barber, That's right. a throwback name, huh? Yeah, and I remember <laughs> there, thank you, and Bob Goldby. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, all those guys back there. And, uh, you know, it's almost like we kind of forgot about those guys all of a sudden. It's good to bring those names up so we get back in the golf lexicon out there. For anyone who doesn't know those names, do some research on those past a- Absolutely. Grades. Love that. Um, let's talk about um, old relics and, and pieces in the game. I'm curious, um, is there something that you hold on to that's in your possession um, that you maybe held on to too long, whether it's an 11 iron or a bullet putter or something old from decades ago? Mm, yeah. Uh, what's notable in, in your garage or closet? Probably uh, I started out um, when I was in, uh, I was on the road in the apparel business and I traveled all over. I was collecting books. So uh, I have the badminton book back in the late 1890s, early 1890s, wow. uh, second edition. It's a benchmark for most people that uh, are serious book collectors. 
uh, I also stub, stub, uh, stumbled on, as I just stumbled right now. That was a perfect stumble right there, yeah. Yeah. A, uh, Ithaca, New York, I was in an old uh, antique barn, and they had a Walter Travis practical golf book. A bit tattered, but lo and behold, inside, I find his signature. So there's one that I sold at, at our group's uh, convention maybe 15 years ago. I probably wish I still had that because mm, interesting. I've seen better books, but we can't exhume Mr. Travis to sign it again. And how long, how, how old is that book dated back to? About? That was early 1900s and it was first edition also. So pr the term practical golf in the early 1900s. What did that mean? What were they prescribing in that book? What, was that, what did that teach there? <laughs> it, it was just a uh, kind of like an overview of the game, how you go out, go yeah. out and play it. Um, most of those books back then were quasi-instructional uh, and just talked about the game itself. Very cool. Um, so again, like you mentioned, you're with the Golf Heritage Society, uh, which does a great job. It's a connecting network for golf historians and fans of the history of the game. I'm curious, how did you originally find GHS and come into the organization? Yeah, so I have a childhood friend um, who was much more into golf than I was. He, he was a uh, insurance man in his former life, and we all know those guys have a lot of time on their oh, hands. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. They so, can play all they want, right? So he was getting 80 to 100 rounds in. Yeah, of course he was. And uh, got involved with the uh, uh, Golf Collector Society uh, in the early days. And he dragged me on to uh, a couple of the trade shows down in Dayton, Ohio at the time. And uh, I really, I started getting more into books then. But I really liked the camaraderie and seeing these these fellas every year. And we they had a... we. We'd have putting contests. We'd, we'd swap stories of favorite courses. It was just the fellowship to me was the underlying uh, benefit of, of meeting these guys. Very cool. Now I got to ask about the hickories. Are you as well versed in the, in the hickories and playing with them as Dr. Byrne is? Or what, what's your relationship with the classic clubs? Uh, yeah, so I, I would say that I certainly appreciate them. Uh, I, I do play with them, uh, but I will uh, Admit, as a double-digit handicapper, I'm not that adept. <laughs> yes, you're speaking to a lot of people out there. Don't worry, you're not alone. It's okay. I, I don't worry. I know I'm. I know I'm in the majority. People out there, <laughs> don't ever uh, be fooled. Okay. <laughs> I oh, love it. Um, let's talk about the the idea of attending these events. Like you mentioned, that's kind of where you fell in love with the GHS. Um, just a quick pitch for anyone out there who's interested in what the history of golf brings um, to our society and just the idea of having them out to an event and what they can experience there. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it's, it's going to go back not only to history, but the fellowship. And mm. I think a lot of young people today, they, they see the, uh, the smashers out there, um, and what they probably don't know is a lot of these young guys out there do have an affinity for the history of golf, but it's just not on TV for, the, for them to see it and, 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 right. to, and to know it's there. But the, when I mentioned Don January, you said Bryson DeChambeau, it would be neat to do a, a then and now where who was the Rory McIlroy of the day, okay? Yeah. Who was the Jordan Spieth of the day? And, and for all these personalities out there, there's one that we can dial back Maybe there's there's three. We could dial back 30 years, 60 years, and 90 years. And if we took maybe 20 current pros, it would be neat to fill in the blanks on who were those guys back then. Yeah, and I also want to do the side-by-side -side of Don January's diet in 1974 yeah. versus Bryson DeChambeau's diet in 2023. Yeah, if, I mean, <laughs> be, being in the, in the clothing business, uh, I can pretty much tell – what somebody uh, weighs and, and, and how tall they are. And if I remember what was striking about January, he had a 32-inch thir waist. And when Lee Trevino coined the term flat bellies to all the young Turks that were in there, mm. um, Don January was a flat belly when he was 65 years old. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Love that. That's awesome. Um, all right. Bill Robinson, again, Vice President, Golf Heritage Society, um, and obviously uh, with the Region 10, the international region. Talk to me about that region and just, you know, the international scale of GHS. You know, you're, you're dealing with golf in Canada, being there from yourself. Well, yeah, golf is uh, off the charts everywhere. Uh, you've probably heard this a gazillion times. Uh, any regression that it had, COVID was the stimulus that uh, certainly got it focused again. Um, you, you do find in different parts of the world, uh, very centric passions, 
based on more history like Ireland, Scotland, obviously, even France, uh, a lot of these countries, Germany, they, they, they are very much enriched uh, with the sport. Very cool. Let's get to some golf destinations. I'm curious about Canada golf destinations. I, my knowledge is admittedly fairly limited. I've seen a lot of content around places like Cabot Links and unique destinations in Canada. I've obviously seen the Canadian Open for years and years at Glen Abbey and those different venues. Um, what's maybe uh, some more unique or notable destinations for Canada golf? So uh, in Ontario, where I live, uh, yep. you, you go up into what they call the Muskokas. You'll so, certainly seen a, a lot of very nice courses. And uh, the main characteristic would be uh, the amount of, of, of granite stone that you see, almost like a brookline, because oh, okay. that whole ridge runs through up there. And, and almost every course, if they keep it the way it's designed, they're, they're dealing with those outcroppings. So that makes it very cool. Obviously, a lot of trees, um, all characteristics of playing up north. I was fortunate enough. Five years ago, we went out to Prince Edward Island. Mm, um, yes. I grew up in New England, so I know a lot of mm -hmm. the PI, but I've never been there before. Yeah. So uh, we went out there, 16 of us, and uh, it was our own self, uh, self-made self trip. And uh, the last day, we had four of us that had a breakaway. We didn't have Crowbush on the uh, agenda. And and everybody had paid. And some guys, well, I don't want to pay the extra for Crowbush. But we were that close. So myself and three other buds, went around. we went down there and, and played Crowbush, uh, kind of a gem like like Cabot Links. Crowbush. Okay, yeah. that's a new one on my radar. I'm going to yeah. check that out. And, love uh, it. And, uh, and Bill, we love wrapping up our conversations with our 19th hole questions. Let's get right to it. Uh, when you get uh, into the clubhouse, your favorite 19th hole after a long day on the course, what's your go-to order? What's your favorite meal and drink that you have to have at the 19th hole? Wow. So uh, I'm always a, a cheeseburger fan, especially when chefs listen to me, when you can cook it on the medium rare side, as long as the beef's fresh, you don't have to overcook it. Oh, okay. Medium rare. All right. So we've had a lot of conversation uh, about grilled versus raw onions on the burger, but you're focused on how the patties cook. It's like got, that. yeah, it's okay. got to have some juice left in it. <laughs> Yo, the burgers, that's the number one answer. What's the drink to go with it? Yeah. Say? So today I would, uh, I'd probably be looking at, uh, a yingling or something like that. Yeah, burger and a beer. Can't go wrong with that. Right? Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Bill, thank you so much for hopping on the Course of Life. Enjoy PGA Show Week. And uh, best of luck with everything with GHS down the line as well. Great to be here today. Thanks very much. And we're back. Great chat there with Bill Robertson from the GHS. Yes. Uh, Fra Francis Waymet. There, there's my old golfer. New England connection, obviously. That's about as old as it gets, actually. Touche I mean, there. Yeah. I, I asked yeah. you your name an old golfer, and you really came, came through there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> obviously, the legend of the partying, Walter Hagen. Love talking about yeah. Walter Hagen. That guy. If Walter Hagen was around during social media, he would be canceled so fast. You, you, your head oh would spin. That guy was partying. Oh he was having a good old time. But yeah, it was fun going down the, the well of old golfers. Bob Golby talk there. Miller Barber, names I haven't mentioned in decades. So uh, really cool to connect with Bill. And of course, Dr. Byrne. Love our friends at the GHS. If you like that conversation, plus everything else we do here on the podcast, please hit that like button. Give us a rating of a couple stars, maybe three or four, five, six, ten, however many you feel uh, like handing out to us. We, we appreciate it. It helps us get this podcast out for more people to hear it. And uh, if you're listening, you like it. So you must want to share it in some way. This is a really passive aggressive way to share it is to just give it a few stars. That's right. Or if you're just stealing picks from me right now as well, too, give it a like or yeah. subscribe as well. Speaking of picks, let's talk college basketball. Yep. Uh, March Madness. What a weekend. Uh, how's your bracket doing? It's not as busted as the rest of America's is. Um, <laughs> it is busted. We are all you got, busted. You got, you got your national championship still there? I do. You got your national champion? I got my national champion. I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I have a weird bracket with UCLA winning. Um, mm -hmm. where, where I'm, that's the one I've been focused on. Um, I had another one with Purdue though. So that one's completely busted. Shout out yeah. Purdue for just be getting hammered by underdogs continuously in March madness. What a horrible run they've had recently. Yeah. That's just, that's just too bad. FDU uh, Mike, really. Fairleigh Dickinson Dang. university with the 16 seed over the one. Amazing. 
old competitor to ours that uh, they had Quinnipiac in the MAC. That, that's uh, what got me texting NAC, you. The NAC, that's, yeah. That's what got me texting you after a couple of beers. I was like, you know, this could be us. You know, <laughs> it, it, this doesn't look that hard. I know Fairly Dickinson, okay? I, they, yeah. I recognize them. They're one of us. So one day the Quinnipiac Bobcat men team uh, will get there. The ladies have already done it multiple times over, but uh, our, our men will get there eventually on the bracket. Yeah. Uh, let's also just mention this is uh, – what is this? This is the first time hmm. uh, or, or the fourth time I think actually it is that like Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, and UNC, none of them are in – are I making it to the second week, something like that. It's the like blue crazy. bloods are out. Yeah. Yeah. You got the likes of uh, Princeton. Princeton. I said it. I said it, Alex. Princeton, the Ivies are always good for at least one win. And look at them. They are now playing Crichton, a very beatable six seed, because they have a nice path now to the, to the Elite Eight. They're in the Sweet Go 16. Ahead, say it. I, mean, I mean, Princeton. It's wow. The only question is, Mike, are they winning one game or two this week? That's the only question. <sighs> uh, I mean, I think, I, think, I think we can agree they could beat Crichton. They could. They're playing pretty well. Who uh, who, the they, who is, they play the winner of if they beat Creighton? Who who's on the other I side mean, of there? I feel like it's going to be Alabama. Oh yeah, okay, that's a problem. That's a big and, problem. Yeah, that's going to be problematic. So wow. okay, uh, but but the know. but the St. Peter's vibes are here for Princeton. Shout out to the yeah. Smart kids from the Ivy League. They figured it mm-hmm. out. They got two wins, and they did it with ease. Honestly, the second round win against yeah. Missouri was a, a walk in the park for them. So. Yeah, it really was. It really was. Um, so, so now we got to look at, at who's left here in this, in the 16, uh, you, you got another article coming out on run your pool, new favorite. Who's going to win it all? Texas Longhorns. Ooh. I, and I, okay. I haven't said this in a long time because the Longhorns have had a horrible history in this tournament in recent years. Basically, since I got here, the entire Texas athletic department has been cursed by my, by me moving here, um, football, basketball, and all sports in between, probably except for the golf, actually. Uh, so the, the Longhorn men team has had some issues around this moment in the tournament. They've gotten over the hump into the second week. They are poised. Dylan DeSue looks amazing. Interim coach doing it, getting it done. He looks just like Gus Fring from Breaking Bad. He's a spitting image of him. Fun vibes all around. This could be the year that the Texas Longhorns get to the final four in Houston, Texas. Like we mentioned that Texas Houston matchup. I think that's destined to happen this weekend. All right. We'll see what happens and we'll report back next week and see whether we're smart or dumb. I have a feeling we're going to be dumb. Okay. Cause it's March madness. You just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's been, uh, I do want to talk college hockey though, because the Quinnipiac Bobcats are in the tournament. We're number two. We're playing against Merrimack to okay. open it on Friday the 24th. All right. Uh, and the the Frozen Four and the National Championship are in Tampa. That's only like six, seven hours from That's me. That's a place that you and I can get to. I know. You know. And I went there, what was it, eight years ago when we were in the National Championship? Like right after I moved here, we we made it into the Frozen Four. And I, I remember saying to my boss, I was like, hey, I'm going to need Saturday off. Quinnipiac's going to be in the National Championship. Ha, ha, ha. And he was like, okay. And they made it to the national championship and he gave me like the half of the day off. So I, and the next day off so I could go to the game. I don't want to talk about the game. Nothing happened like to the game. The there, game was no, there was no game actually. The game never no, happened. So. I don't want to talk about the game itself, but you know, I was at a national championship game and I'd rather be at one that I can remember fondly. So just saying. No pressure, right? No right, pressure. Bobcats, you know what to do. Hey, they've been there before. They know how to get there. Uh, so hopefully yeah. we can get back to the Frozen Four. And, and you know, there's some bitter taste in the mouth after losing to Colgate in the semifinals of the ECAC tournament. So, you know, I think we want we want it now. We really want to show that we, we that wasn't a dud. Definitely. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Let's hashtag always in with food. Yeah, let's do it. It's our food segment to end every Course of Life podcast and a very special one this week because, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm working on the spot here. I'm going to go ahead and need you to get out the breaking news sounder. Hit it. Hit it. There you go. Breaking don't have, we don't have any money to actually do sound effects. Breaking so. news, <laughs> breaking news. It will be written in my runyourpool.com article. That's right. I wrote an entire article about Scotty Scheffler's masterful champions dinner menu that just came out and hit the internet this past week. And I have breaking news. I mean, it doesn't get any more breaking than this, Mike. I was at the course today, and who did I run into? But Scotty Scheffler walking Master off the range. 
world number one. Yeah, I, I hear he plays golf, right? His golf is golf. I, right? Supposedly, he's pretty good at it. He is. He is. I didn't even compliment him on his golf. Actually, I only had one <laughs> wow. question for him. I had one question for him because this master's menu that he put out was a tour de force. It's two amazing appetizers. It's a wonderful starter. It's in a bevy of main meats and sides that could put you in a coma and a dessert that's to die for. But there was one thing that stood out, and it was that the sliders on his appetizer for the menu were served Scotty style. Now, no one knew what Scotty style was when that menu came out. I have the answer. I got the answer from the source, Mike. Yeah. Scotty Share style it. sliders. Very simple. No secret sauce. There's no secret you know, sauce or slaw or anything. Just fries on the bun. So Ooh. fries on the bun are the secret Scotty-style wow. sliders that will be served at the Master Champions Dinner menu from the source himself, world number one, Scotty Scheffler. You know, I was thinking this before you, uh, you even tweeted this as well. And uh, um, Ryan Balaji said it as I was thinking it. Very Pittsburgh of him. Very Pittsburgh. Which is, is funny because Scotty's not from Pittsburgh. <laughs> He's a Texan through and through. Dallas, yeah. school in Austin, you know, Texas for life. But that's a Pittsburgh vibe. That's the Primani Brothers vibe sandwich where they put the fries in the gigantic sandwich. Correct? I got the name right there? It's Primani Brothers? Uh, yeah, I, I think, think so. Yeah, I've never been to Pittsburgh. I'm just taking your word for it there. Yeah, yeah, that's the vibe. So that was interesting to hear. So Scotty style sliders, fries in the bun. I wonder if there's also going to be fries on the side. Maybe maybe we'll get a picture to confirm that or not. But uh, regardless, there, there's your drinkingness. Like, I mean, it's crazy. I'd rather have a different kind of fry on the side. But that makes us think, too. I mean, what would we have if we had won the Masters? What would we have on the menu? Yeah, so I'm going to I'm gonna leave it up to the people. And, I'm, and, and the Run Your Pool people can thank me for this. My entire menu is in my article. So I put yeah. my entire menu in my article. So check out runyourpool.com, uh, search for Alex, search for golf, and you'll find my entire menu. But Mike, I'm, I'm handing it over to you for you're always yeah. in with food, Mike. So let, let's yeah. get right into it. Master's Champions Dinner Menu. We're going to yep. start with two appetizers for you. Mm -hmm. What do you got? Uh, I'm going to go with my favorites here. So I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to start with bacon wrapped water chestnuts. You talk about those a lot. You do. Yeah. I love them. Nice, sweet ketchup sauce on it. It's fantastic. I mm -hmm. love it. Okay. That's good. And, um, crab cakes. Oh, that's a big miss for me. <laughs> That's a big miss. I know. I was, I was wondering if you were going to bring these misses to the forefront and you just mm. brought one right to me yep. there. Okay. Yep. Well done. Nice, nice appetizers. Okay. And then in between, before the main, there was a starter. I kind of went very vanilla with my starter. Uh, Scotty went a little bit harder with his starter dish in a tortilla soup and an ode to Texas. What would you do for like a little starter soup salad action? I, I would do a salad, something light, I and mean, even just a basic Caesar. I don't think you need to go crazy with what you're doing there. I mean, a Caesar is light, it's refreshing, it saves you up for the main course because you know that's probably going to be heavy. Yes, perfect segue. So, so main course being two meats and sides. Uh, yeah. I went with a couple classic meats. Now, I prefer them grilled. I don't know exactly what Scotty's asking for on his steak and fish that he put on the menu. And then he did a bevy of amazing sides. But what 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 does the the two meat or the meat and three kind of plate look like for you here? Well, definitely steak. Yeah. I mean, it has to be steak. Uh, and I think you have to maybe do it with some sort of compound butter, something to just kind of nice. enhance the flavor of that like steak. It. Like it. Uh, and then, well, we, do we need a fish in there too, I guess? So maybe maybe a salmon dish uh i'm a big fan of a um so, something we make for the holidays called salmon and crout it's salmon and puff pastry with this kind of rice that it sits on that's uh got some leeks and mushrooms in it and oh, yeah. served with a creme fraiche dill sauce it's fantastic M mike they'll make whatever for you whatever you want i don't make it I know. You so there you go so those are my two proteins uh insides i i mean even just a mixed vegetable grill is medley i mean that's the meats are your are your or your your stars of your show. Okay. And even like roasted vegetables, you don't think how good they are until you have them. A roasted vegetables or even like a you know, I I did recently I did like a roasted vegetable salad and I made this maple vinaigrette to go on it. It was fantastic. Hmm, that sounds divine. Might I might yep. add that too. Jeez, love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's round it out with the dessert. Last but not least, I mean, you you are the the curator unofficially of desserts on this podcast. So, so what are you going with? I am, but I'm going to go I'm going to go to Love Field here. You ready? Oh boy. Ice cream sundaes. Oh, man. Just right down the middle. Hot fudge sundae? I mean, why not? I mean, 
it's 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 what you know it's different it's playful it's fun it reminds you that you're a kid and you're just playing a game because that's golf is just a game that's all it is i mean it's a game you want to win and you're going to win a crap ton of money if you do it right but it's a game love it couldn't have ended it better myself that was always end with food and a wrap on a fantastic course of life episode thank you to everyone for tuning in uh if you see me out at the dell match play or you see me on the boat be sure to say hi as well too everyone have a good week and we'll see you next week